Thank you, Amy. Yeah, if you have questions, just type them into that little Q&A box right there, or you can hit the uh, raise hand button that you see along the bottom of your screen. And uh, when you do that, Amy will interrupt me at, a, at any point, and you can ask that question live. If you do ask it live, just make sure that you click to unmute yourself. Uh, otherwise, we'll catch those uh, Q&A questions that you type in uh, as we see fit, or we'll also have some time at the end. So let's jump right into it. Thanks again to the Warfield and the Friends. This uh, Digging Deeper discussion will be titled La Nina, Boom or Bust? And uh, hopefully we'll learn a bit about La Nina along the way and what it means for here. So we're going to jump right in with the official forecast because I feel like if I hold that from you till the end, uh, you guys will hate me for it. So we'll go right to the CPC's official forecast of La Nina for the year. Then we're gonna dive into what La Nina actually is. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of people have an idea of what La Nina might mean for them, uh, depending on where they're from. But a lot of folks kind of lack, you know, what actually is La Nina? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the effects of La Nina globally, nationwide, and locally here in South Central Idaho, Central Mountains. I'll give you some parting thoughts or some considerations about La Nina. And then at the very end, I'll give you Ethan's super accurate precip and uh, temperature forecasts. So be sure to stick around for that one. So who makes the predictions? Really, it's the National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center. Uh, and then everybody else. In my opinion, there's the National Weather Service and the CPC are the ones that if you just had to pick one forecast, that's probably the one to follow. Uh, they have folks that are climate scientists that watch this sort of thing day in and day out. So really, there, when we're talking about any sort of predictions in this discussion, we're gonna be talking a lot about uh, data from the CPC. When we talk about everybody else, uh, not to say that they're bad, they're just other outlets that you might find predictions about La Nina or El Nino, uh, the Weather Channel, WeatherWorks, Weather Bell, the old Farmer's Almanac, or the Farmer's Almanac, there are actually two, um, a little bit further down on the list, but hey, you can get your information where you please, your neighbor. Uh, so. Unless you know your neighbor is watching this right now, I'd probably discredit what your neighbor has to think, but neighbors seem to have a lot of opinions about what the winter's gonna be like. Squirrels, uh, believe it or not, um, or actually any animal of your choice that seems to be a lot of myths around whether we're gonna have a good winter or not based on some sort of animal activity and I have kind of a fun story uh, to relate to that a little bit later. The official forecast. La Nina gains strength in November. This is straight from the CPC who monitors this. Forecasters estimate that there's a 95% chance that La Nina will last through the winter. Remember, La Ninas can come and go and fade or transition into El Nino. They estimate a 50% chance that it will fade into the spring. What does that mean for temperature across the United States for this winter? This is a three month average from January, February, and March, this upcoming. And you can see the cooler temperature or the cooler colors on there, the blues are below average temperatures. The uh, reds are above average temperatures. And that swath in the middle doesn't really have that great of a predictive uh, probability to it. And you have equal chance of either being below uh, normal or above normal, normal temperatures. And you can see that's where Idaho is falling right there. Um, so we have an equal chance, so a 33% chance that it'll be near normal temperatures, the same for above and the same for below. Some other areas that actually have a little bit higher predictive ability for temperatures this year, according to the CPC, are North, the Northwest, which is often the case. So Washington has a 50% chance to be cooler than normal. And also down in uh, Texas, we can see that uh, South Texas has more than a 60% chance of being warmer than normal. And I think that might come as a surprise to a lot of you from the Northwest. You usually think La Nina equals cool. 
Um, but if you're down in Texas, it actually means the opposite. It's going to be hot. The next prediction that the CPC puts out is the uh, precipitation probability. So we already know that we have equal chances of being near normal, cooler, or warmer. Uh, but here, the CPC predicts that we'll have a little bit of a bump towards a wetter year. So our, our region has a roughly 33 to 40% chance to be above normal precip. Um, or if you want to look at it another way, that's a 66 to 73% chance of near to above normal precip. And uh, that sounds pretty good to me. So we'll hope it holds true. So what is La Nina? Uh, being a Pacific Northwest born guy myself from Oregon, you know, I hear La Nina and I think cool and wet. But as we just discussed earlier, if you happen to be from Texas, you might think La Nina means dry and warm. One thing to understand with La Nina is that La Nina is actually just a part of a larger uh, oscillation called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO for short. So La Nina is really just a phase of ENSO. So it can be La Nina one year, neutral the next, and then flop back over to El Nino on other years. And this flop back and forth between El Nino, neutral, and La Nina occurs roughly every two to seven years, but it's pretty irregular. And each phase triggers predictable disruptions in temperature of the sea surface, uh, global temperature, precipitation patterns, and winds. And it's actually quite remarkable what, uh, what sorts of predictions can be made. So if we take a quick look at what the ocean's temperatures do during a La Nina and an El Nino year, we'll start on the top of this uh, image with La Nina. Cool temperatures here are departures, cooler departures from normal temperature. So these uh, blues here mean colder water than normal across the uh, equatorial Pacific. In an El Nino year, you have warmer water than normal across the equatorial Pacific. These uh, temperature departures are, you know, can be pretty stunning, uh, up to nine degrees warmer or nine degrees cooler, so a 20 degree swing. So that's, that's kind of what the signature of the ocean looks like during a La Nina and an El Nino year. Uh, La Nina having cooler water and El Nino having warmer water. Remember though that this is an oscillation that's both uh, that's linked between the ocean and the atmosphere. So if you look at the atmospheric response to an El Nino or warmer water in the equatorial Pacific off of the west coast of South America here, this warm water really concentrates thunderstorm activity uh, along the tropics. These are huge, huge full atmospheric depth thunderstorms that uh, shift global weather patterns pretty dramatically. These form right over the warm water pool. So if you jump ahead to what a La Nina looks like, remember La Nina replaces that warm water with cold water and that warm water gets pushed to the west over Indonesia. So that shift from, we'll jump back, El Nino, where those uh, deep tropical thunderstorms are occurring closer to the United States or the west coast of South America, to La Nina conditions uh, in which those tropical thunderstorms get pushed over Indonesia have uh, some pretty dramatic effects. One of those effects uh, that I find pretty interesting is when you have increased updrafts with these thunderstorms, that sucks air in from below, both from Africa over and from our coast and uh, the west coast of South America over, increasing the trade winds along the, the equator. So normally along the equator, we have pretty steady winds that, that run from east to west toward Indonesia. In El Nino conditions with uh, these tropical thunderstorms, 
moved over, you can actually have the trade winds reduce in speed or even switch directions um, and blow against you. And in La Nina conditions, the trade winds are strengthened. A quick look at what the uh, temperatures look like out there right now over uh, the equatorial Pacific Ocean. You can see again this cold tongue of uh, cooler water that's sitting near the surface of the ocean. And that again is pushing those thunderstorms over Indonesia and changing the whole equation when it comes to where high and low pressures are, are located, where the jet stream is, and uh, where the snow and uh, temperature patterns actually fall. So how is La Nina measured? Well, they, scientists like to look at this little box here, this red box called the Nino 3.4 box. And essentially there, you can imagine just drawing this box down between 120 degrees west and 170 degrees west and a little bit north and a little bit south of the equator there. And they monitor the temperature, the average temperature within this box. Warm water moving into this box increases that average. Cool water moving into that box decreases the average. And when it meets a certain threshold um, over a three month average, that's when they determine whether we have El Nino or La Nina conditions. Again, just showing a little animation here. These are the sea surface temperatures over the equatorial Pacific uh, starting in October and running through early December. And you can see this little tongue of moisture or this little tongue rather of a uh, cooler air kind of sneaking its cooler water, excuse me, sneaking its way into this box. And uh, it's starting to get cooler temperatures on average within the Nino 3.4 box. They take a running three month average of those and plot them to come up with a graph that looks like this. And if you look on the left side, we've got 1950 here. On the far right side, we have 2020. And we go through these phases of cooler temperatures within the Nino 3.4 box, um, which are shown by these little blue spikes coming down below. And then uh, red spikes kind of sticking up above our El Nino or warmer temperatures. And these are departures from zero. So this is a temperature scale on the left, a half a degree, one degree, and so forth. And what's really uh, important, uh, Noah has found, as far as it links to predictable weather patterns, is we have this uh, threshold of about a half, half a degree. So we consider it a La Nina if these temperatures get cooler than a half a degree, and an El Nino if they get warmer than half a degree. And you can see how it oscillates kind of between El Nino years or neutral years, which aren't necessarily warm or cool, and then back to La Nina or back to El Nino, again on that kind of two to seven year time scale. Zooming in on that same graph, we can just look at the last six years starting in um, the winter of 2014 and 15. 2014, 15, we entered a moderate uh, El Nino that actually turned into quite a strong El Nino through the winters of uh, 15, 16. This is January of 16 right here. Then we flop back to cooler temperatures in the Nino 3.4 region. So cooler temperatures in that, in that little box again. That signified well, kind of uh, almost a La Nina, but not quite. And then we had a weak La Nina, our last La Nina winter season, uh, which was January 17, 18 the winter of 1718. We shifted back into more El Nino conditions recently. And as you can see, as we head into the core winter months of this year, we have a, a moderate to a fairly strong La Nina forming. Again, it, it only takes a half a degree to be a uh, La Nina. And we're looking at more than a degree off of uh, normal in that Nino 3.4 region. In fact, uh, in November, the temperature was the seventh lowest of all Novembers uh, going back to 1950. So it's, it's pretty cool water down there right now. So now how does that all link to weather patterns? 
globally, uh, I just, I think this is pretty fascinating. The fact that just a change in the water temperature in the equatorial Pacific, whether we have warm water here or cool water here can affect uh, the climate for the winter or summer months globally, uh, which is pretty striking. So because we're in a La Nina condition, this is uh, weather associated with La Nina now, this, this image is, we have dry and cool conditions where that cold water is sitting. Those thunderstorms are all pushed to the west over Indonesia. And uh, we have enhanced rainfall across the Western Pacific, Indonesia, the Philippines, and um, very, very dry conditions where those storms are absent. Wetter than normal conditions also tend to favor Northern South America, Southern Africa, the British Columbia region in Canada, and Southern Alaska. Drier than normal conditions are generally observed along coastal Ecuador, Northwestern Purdue, uh, Purdue, Peru, and uh, portions of the American Southwest and uh, the Gulf Coast. Um, generally speaking, when there's La Nina, phenomenon going on, the global uh, temperatures are a bit cooler. Um, the climate for that season is a bit cooler than average. One notable exception though, as we pointed out kind of in the beginning, is uh, parts of the desert southwest Texas and the Gulf Coast is both drier and warmer in uh, La Nina winter. Zooming in a bit on North America, and we can look at what the average um, we can look at what the average weather patterns look like over North America. So again, we have that cold, cool air, which happens to be sinking because there's rising motion going on over in the western um, equatorial Pacific. So we have this blocking high pressure that really amplifies the jet stream and pushes it a bit to the north. Um, this blue line here is going to signify just in the average location of the jet stream over the winter. And what you can infer from this is that anything kind of near the jet stream is where a lot of the storm energy is going to be and where a lot of the storms are going to occur. So that's going to be wetter. Anything north of the jet stream is going to be colder because it's allowing this cold air to sink in um, from the Arctic through Canada. And it doesn't have a lot of moisture associated with it because it originated up in, in the Arctic. And then generally speaking to the south of the jet stream, we have warmer air, which will originate closer to the, to the tropics. So you, as you can see, Idaho is kind of right under or right near where the average uh, storm track is going to be in a La Nina winter, which you know, if the jet stream was right here, that's that's a great place for us to get a lot of snow in the Western Smokies, uh, in the Banner Summit area, maybe not quite as much down in the Wood River Basin um, with this type of flow. But the fact that we'd be near the jet stream is a good thing because that means it'll bring uh, ample storms our way to uh, central Idaho. Okay, we made it. We uh, learned a little bit more about what La Nina actually is. And remember, it's a coupling of both warmer, or sorry, La Nina is a coupling of cooler equatorial Pacific sea surface temperatures. And then that shift of those big thunderstorm systems to the west over Indonesia. Um, now, what does that actually have to do with uh, what kind of snow we see on average during a La Nina winter? So each one of these images of North America is a different winter. So if you look up here, this is 1973-74, um, you know, on down to 1984-85, and they're sorted by moderate La Ninas on this uh, season to very strong La Ninas up in this season. Uh, what you can see on average, uh, again, these colors here are going to be uh, additional uh, precipitation in green colors and deficits from normal precipitation in brown colors. So in the 1973-74 season, we had additional precip in the Pacific Northwest and portions of central Idaho with a strong La Nina. 
we also had a strong La Nina in this year, but we did see actually below normal uh, precipitation. So that can happen in a La Nina winter. But if you just kind of work your way through these and look at Idaho in particular, uh, any sign you see in green over Idaho, that means above average precipitation. And you can see that pretty much all of these La Ninas show some shade of green over the central mountains of Idaho with only a couple exceptions. And that's a good thing. Well, if you like snow. Another way to look at it is how much snow is there in April? So um, how you can kind of think of this as um, snow depth with the blue dots being um, above average snow depths on April 1st and the red dots or the kind of pinkish dots being below average snow depth on April 1st. And again, if you kind of imagine where that jet stream was going for that average jet stream coming across the Pacific Northwest right here, everything roughly on this diagonal or above has been showing that the, the snow is hanging on in there a little bit longer into the spring. And below where we'd expect to see a little bit drier conditions, they had below average snowfalls in the, in the desert Southwest, below average snow depths, I should say, in the spring. <clears throat> Ethan, is now a good time to, to interject with a couple questions we have? For sure, yeah. Okay, we have just two quick ones that seem like a relevant timing. Tim is asking, I'm curious, could Ethan explain on how the Banner Summit area could see such different weather than Haley and Wood River Valley? Yeah, definitely. So if we skip back to the jet stream path, um, a lot of it just has to do with the direction that the wind and the weather is coming from. So if you've been around the valley long enough, you hear um, people talk about um, South Valley storms where the Big Wood and the Soldier Mountains do really, really well. And those tend to happen when there's a low pressure system that, that uh, dips, whoops, a low pressure, a surface low pressure that dips really far to our south and kind of directs moisture up from the southwest and the south. And there aren't a whole lot of mountains between the ocean, which is where all that moisture is coming from, and where we are, if you draw a line straight kind of from this angle right here, um, which really enhances the amount that get dumped into the into the Wood River Basin. So we like we like storms that come from the south and southwest down here. If you're in Stanley or up in Banner Summit, um, you want storms generally that are coming from the west or the northwest. Um, so in this last system, which I'm, I'm thinking that question kind of stemmed from, we, we had some wind and, and precip coming in from the south initially, but the jet stream was pretty far north. And it was really only the energy producing that kind of precipitation was, was more closely tied to the jet stream, which was over actually just slightly north of Banner. And we were quite a ways away from it down here in the, in the Wood River Valley. So it was a combination of the jet being a little bit too far to the north, which was favoring Banner, and also that the wind directions, um, even if there is moisture and it's headed our way, it usually gets ringed out of any sort of uh, clouds being pushed up and over the you know six or eight mountain ranges that it has to get over before it ends up in the Wood River Valley. Great, thanks Ethan. And then one last question for this quick break. Um, Jamie's asking, I think about La Nina in general, what time of year, winter only in the Northern hemisphere or both summer and winter? Yeah, it's actually, um, it occurs uh, throughout the year. So, so La Nina conditions, the, the amount that it can predict the climate in different parts of the globe is with a little bit more precision in the winter time, but that's meaning winter, our Northern hemispheric winter. Um, at the same time, that has a, a good uh, predictability in the Southern hemisphere as well. Uh, so if you look back at this, um, you know, it's, it's summertime down here and it can be wet and cool in the, uh, you know, in the southern portion of Africa 
and that is based on our, you know, our what we think of as a wintertime phenomenon. Um, just because we're in the northern hemisphere, but it's happening in the summers down here in in uh, southern Africa. So it's it's showing uh, connections, you know, throughout the globe, and they're year round, but they're most pronounced during the northern hemisphere times. Great, thanks. That's all the questions we have so far. Cool, great questions. Thank you. Uh, moving on to this uh, plot here, which we kind of looked at, you know, how much snow is left over in April, um, how much more precipitation we might get, both of which are favoring us for La Nina's. This, this plot here actually shows how much additional seasonal snowfall we might expect during a moderate to uh, strong La Nina winter. And if you check out Idaho here in the middle for our region during a strong La Nina winter, which it looks like we're, we have a pretty good odds to, to continue that through this winter, the average additional snowfall is generally uh, one to two feet of extra snow uh, over the course of the winter. So where are we at right now? How are we doing this year? <clears throat> um, if we take a close look at this graph here, what, what it's showing, you can kind of essentially look at these lines as our snowpack building throughout the year, okay? This is November, uh, the beginning of the winter, and then out to the spring. And as the lines climb, that's when it's snowing. If the lines go flat, that's when we're not getting any more snow or precipitation. And then eventually out here in the spring, as these lines start to dive, uh, you can think of that as essentially the snow melting faster than it's accumulating. It doesn't mean that it's not snowing, but it means that the snowpack is, is essentially shrinking. And this plot here uh, shows our maximum snowpack here, our minimum snowpack here during this 30-year uh, record period, our average, which is this green line, and the black line is how we're doing right now. Uh, as of the 22nd. So we started off pretty dry, and I should point out that this is the Bigwood Basin, um, not north of the pass, but the Bigwood side. And we've got this little black line here shows that we had a pretty good hit of snowfall, and then we had that long kind of three week plus drought that we dealt with um, that finally ended about 10 days ago. And about 10 days ago, we started getting snow again, and we're climbing back up. But the fact that we're below this green line right here means that we are still below average for this time of year. If we add in another La Nina winter, um, another strong La Nina winter, in the winter of 2011, 2012, it's actually kind of eerily similar how we started off slow, had one early season storm, and then just a heck of a drought with no precip falling for you know, based on this looks like almost six weeks before some larger storms caught us back up. Eventually we reached near normal uh, during midwinter and late spring. And it looks like overall we had a pretty average snowpack. Our last La Nina was a weak La Nina. Again, that was uh, 2017, 2018. And that's this purple line that I've added in there now. Again, with a kind of a strange, it, it just seems to be the pattern. We get a, a, a bump of uh, early season snow and then we kind of have a drought for a little while, which builds those beautiful weak layers that we're dealing with right now at the base of the snowpack. And uh, again, we were below average because we're below this green line for much of the year. So pretty dry early winter, but then we caught up with some big storms in the spring and then reached kind of our, our overall relatively average snowpack uh, by the end of the spring. Ethan, Lynn Wolf has a great question regarding that graph, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, she's asking, what kind of avalanche problems did you have in that 11 to 12 year? <laughs> oh man, I knew that that question might come up. I can only assume because I've, I didn't quite have time to look up our annual report that we had a gnarly uh, persistent slab problem going on um, early that season. I know that we did in 1718, um, which has that exact same pattern. 
and I know that we do right now, which has that exact same pattern. And I can't imagine that it was any different um, in 2011 and 2012, but that was just prior, that was the one winter just prior to me coming down here, so. Great, thanks, Ethan. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Um, this, this image right here, I think, has just a ton of really cool information on it. And I have to thank uh, Mike Houston down at the Pocatello National Weather Service uh, office for this graph here. It shows uh, all winters from 1950 onward. And uh, on the basically what you can see here is the color coding with blue being La Nina winters red being El Nino winters, and gray being neutral winters. And this dotted line in the middle is our average over this whole course. And again, this is in the Bigwood Basin uh, above Haley and Ketchum. So if we start to pick this apart a little bit, each one of these bars is a different winter season. And obviously the taller the bar, the more snow we got, the lower the bar, the less snow we got for that winter. And we'll start to pick out kind of the last five La Nina winters that we saw in this region. Starting with 2007, 2008, we had a near normal snow year. Again, this dotted line is our, our average snow over all types of winters. So that's uh, La Nina, El Nino, and neutral years. In uh, 2008, 2009, we had actually a, a below normal snow year, even though it was still La Nina. Uh, in 2010-11, we had a near normal year. In 2011-12, slightly above. In 2017 and 18, which was a weak La Nina, it actually fared a little bit better for us, and we had an above average snow year. So those are our last five La Nina winters. And again, remember this is average here. So kind of evenly split, slightly below, slightly above, but, but generally clustered near normal. If we go through just a couple of our most recent El Ninos uh, to compare, our 15-16 uh, was quite an above average snowfall year for the, for the Big Wood Basin above Haley there. And that was an El Nino winter. Our 1819 winter was uh, above normal snow year, and that was an El Nino winter. But then we have uh, 1920, which around here was pretty grim uh, in the Haley and Bigwood Valley, and that was a, a well below average uh, snow year. And then, of course, because I know everybody's looking at the, the neutral year that we have way over at the top, um, 2000. 16 and 17 was our record and backbreaking snowfall year. And it was a, a neutral year. It was actually, we were coming out of a La Nina and entering into a, into a neutral phase, um, but it kind of blew us out of the charts and set snow depth records for the area, as well as just overall snowfall records, especially particularly in February. And uh, I wouldn't let you go without telling you uh, the squirrel story here. So, and I'm an arborist in the summertime and the summer of, of uh, 16, yeah, leading up to the winter of 16, 17, squirrels were absolutely going bananas, stashing away uh, pine cones and spruce cones pretty much everywhere I went. And uh, believe it if you want or not, but that was the craziest, display of uh, animals putting away food for the winter. And of course, pretty much everybody I talked to at these houses said, oh, you know, it's going to be a big winter. Uh, and then the uh, CPC forecasts came out, but because it was coming into a, a neutral year, no one really wanted to pull the trigger on a record-breaking snowfall. Uh, so everybody pretty much missed it, except apparently the squirrels and your neighbors on that year. So maybe the outlier years are the ones that you should listen to to nature a little bit more. Um, right as winter was starting, I actually went out in my shed and the squirrel had piled my golf bag, which I hadn't used in years, completely full of uh, pine cones. So there you have it. 
if we kind of look at the breakdown though of dry years versus wet years, <clears throat> dry years being on the left-hand side of average, wet years being on this right-hand side of this average line, you can see that in dry years, they tend to be El Nino winters. On wet years, they tend to be La Nina winters. 43% um, of our above average winters are La Nina years. You add into that the 30% uh, or sorry, the 26% that's neutral years. And generally, if you have a neutral or a La Nina year, there's a two thirds odds that you're gonna end up on this side of the graph, at least in the Big Wood Basin. So some parting thoughts. Remember that Enso and La Nina and El Nino are a linked atmosphere and ocean phenomena um, that has predictable effects across the weather or pr predictable weather effects across the globe and regardless of season. And that in its own right is, is pretty dang cool. Uh, but we also have to remember that Enso only accounts for 40 to 60% of the observed variability in winter weather. So to borrow a quote from the CPC, it's, it's hard to bake a cake with only 40 to 60% of the ingredients, meaning that there's quite a bit of the puzzle left to be determined that you can't just attribute to El Nino and La Nina. There are lots of other factors that go into what the actual weather will be for you in a given region than just El Nino and La Nina, but it is a very important part. Locally, the predictive skill for Idaho is a little bit less than in other areas like the Northwest or down in Texas. But it is safe to say when you're talking to your neighbor after this, that uh, <clears throat> winters in central Idaho are generally cooler and often provide near to slightly above normal precipitation. And uh, you really wanna tell them why it's because of our relative close location to the storm track on average in a La Nina winter. Of course, there are some limitations. Uh, El Nino or La Nina might fade, come and go. It's always changing. Um, so as the CPC predicted, there's a 50% chance going into the spring that La Nina will start to fade. So it may not always develop as forecast. Weak La Ninas or El Ninos have less influence on weather patterns. Uh, so we really, in order to have much predictive skill, we need it to be strong La Ninas, and that's particularly the case in, in Idaho. The presence or absence of one or two big storms can really define the season. So when we're talking about uh, average snowfall versus below or above, one good heavy uh, atmospheric river from the south can completely change the picture and flop us into one category or the other. And we have a very uh, relatively short period of record. Since 1950, there's only been 23 La Nina years. And of those, seven have been classified as strong. So therefore, we're really just basing our climate predictions on a handful of events. And uh, these events are also slightly skewed in the later half of the, the data set as the planet uh, starts to appreciably warm, which, which just complicates the picture. Uh, climate scientists really like to have 30 years of data as a, as a starting point before they like to go out on a limb on these things. And uh, so this data set is, is pretty small. Okay, the time you've all been waiting for, Ethan's super accurate precip and temp forecast. So I've preloaded a, uh, a couple containers here with uh, what I expect or what the CPC expects the, the uh, probabilities for our temperature to be near normal, below normal, um, or above normal. And so there's three of each of those in there to recommend or to uh, represent equal odds. And I'll, uh, I won't look. We're gonna find out right here now whether it'll be warm, cold, or near normal. Cold, I like that, good start. Next. I've got our uh, precipitation below, near, or above. We're all hoping for above. It's slightly uh, weighted, stack the deck in the favor of more precip based on the CPC probability. So shake that up. And 
above. So you, hear, you heard it here first, folks. It's going to be colder than normal. And uh, we're going to get above normal precip. You can take that forecast to the bank. And with that, I'll uh, take any questions. Wow, Ethan, that is some serious forecasting happening right there, right in front of our eyes. Better watch out. Hopefully it happens. <laughs> well, that, that's what I mean. I told you you could take it to the bank, so uh, I didn't pass out my credit card number at all. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for for staying tuned in here with Ethan, sharing some really awesome and insightful information. Um, you can ask your questions. We've already got a couple coming through in the Q&A box, or we would encourage you to ask it by doing the raise hand feature. Um, you can just hit that at the bottom of your screen and it will notify us and then I can click so that you can unmute yourself and it's fun when you can ask in person. We can pretend like we're all at the war field um, drinking a beer together. Um, it's close, closer, right? If you ask him with unmuting yourself. Anyways, as you're thinking of your questions, I will get started with the Q&A box for Ethan here. Uh, we've got one from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, USGS stream gauges suggest that we're seeing earlier runoff. If we're seeing later snowfall and earlier melt, are Nordic skiers hosed? Yeah, so that, well, well, yeah, that, that would be, <laughs> no, I don't want to say your host. Um, those were precip amounts. I can't say necessarily that they were um, snow or rain. A lot of those, a lot of that could have been rain actually falling in the springtime. That were those bumps in the later in the La Nina season or just wet, heavy snowfall. Um, and some of that does drain out. So you do see an overall um, reduction in in the snowpack in that time of year. Uh, if it literally did, if we were seeing later snowfall and earlier melt, then yes, your window for skiing would, would shrink there at the end of the season if that was the case. Okay, now we have a question from Scooter. Um, have you noticed any teleconnection patterns associated with La Nina AO an AO dot, 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 question mark. Yeah, there's, it's, uh, you know, talking with uh, Mike down at the National Weather Service office, um, I think a lot of people are hesitant to put their hat on any of those, particularly um, in, in Idaho. I think some of those connections are a bit more popular to talk about when you're up in the, uh, in the Northwest. Um, Pacific Northwest, I should say. And what uh, Scooter's asking about are, there are other ocean atmosphere oscillations out there. Uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is the PDO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, the MJO, or the Quasi-Biennial Oscillation. They all have, they're all basically connections between the ocean and atmosphere conditions. Um, and they all do affect the climate picture. Uh, but like I said, there's, you know, 40 to 60% of what the CPC looks at when they're putting out their predictions is ENSO related. So that's El Nino and La Nina. And that's really what they're hanging their hat on. Um, beyond that, uh, probably not a whole lot that you could point your finger at definitively for, for Idaho. Uh, other things that they look at are like sea ice, um, land surface conditions, soil moisture, things like that all kind of go into this mix uh, before they put out their forecast. But um, ENSO is really the main player. Awesome, thank you so much, Scooter. Okay, so we have a question from Josh, and I believe he's referring to one of the graphs towards the end of your slideshow. The question is, would you expect this graph to look noticeably different for the Salmon River side of the watershed? with bigger La Nina snow years for areas favored by Northwest flow? Yeah, I would, um, for sure. And that's a great question. So yeah, you know, the Western Smokies banner and basically anything from like kind of North and West of 
Galena Summit, if you're familiar with this area, definitely favor um, Northwest flow. And it and and I shouldn't, you know, that image is maybe a little bit misleading where it shows the jet stream here. It doesn't mean that the wind is in the is always kind of coming from the Northwest. Oftentimes, the ones that kind of favor the soldiers um, will come in from the west and then they'll shift northwest. And oftentimes a lot of the big moisture punch is coming when it's coming from the west. So um, I would expect that, that graph to look different, um, especially if it's, heavily, if it's heavily weighted in west and northwest events. Um, and, uh, and that is what we see in La Nina, so. Thanks, Josh, that was a good question. Okay, so we have a question from an anonymous attendee. What is your opinion on the New Zealand index? And I might add, could you give a quick explanation of that, Ethan? You know, I don't utilize the New Zealand index, so I'm not actually sure that I could um, offer an opinion. Um, but I'm pretty sure, yeah, I actually am gonna stay away from that because I think I'd wade into waters that I'd have to refresh my memory on. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Fair enough. <laughs> Smart answer instead of, you're brave enough to predict the entire season for us. Hey, Cold and above average. You gotta go out on a limb at least sometime. <laughs> All right, if anyone else has questions while we have Ethan here, you can type them in the Q&A box and you can even ask anonymously if you prefer that. Um, otherwise, I would encourage you to do the raise hand feature at the bottom. Um, but Ethan, I have a question for you. For those of us who sit behind our computer every morning and starting to be every night, really any chance, um, checking the weather and you know, on NOAA forecast, you can only see so far ahead for those of us that don't have a degree in weather or meteorology. What advice would you give us and what tools can those of us who are really curious about the snow and forecast, um, what tools can we utilize to, you know, kind of try and predict or ease our curiosity of what the storm is going to do or if the storm will be coming even? Yeah, I would, I would probably steer you away from worrying about whether it's a La Nina year or an El Nino year, because remember those are three month averages. So we're just, you know, if I was a, if I could bet on the next hundred years of La Nina's, you know, and I bet that it was going to be wetter and colder, I'd, I'd be right most of the time, but on any given year, uh, you can't necessarily use that as a predictor for how good your uh, actual skiing or riding is gonna be in your locale. Really, what you need to be doing in that regard is looking at the seven to 10 day weather forecast um, and the position of the jet stream. So if uh, you see the, the jet stream kind of aiming right at us, uh, there's a good chance that a storm is, is either on its way or just passed. And uh, that, that's a good predictor. And then of course, checking our mountain weather forecast on the Avalanche Center's website or your point and click on the um, National Weather Service site to kind of keep track of what's going on there. Great. So we have another question coming in from Jamie. Do La Nina slash El Nino predictions say anything about winds locally along the coast? Yeah, so I guess winds that would affect us really just with the, with the average position of the jet stream being more directly in line with where we are, we'll see windier weather on average. Uh, and really what's driving that is just the, there's a pretty sh sharp boundary between cooler, cooler air to the north of the jet and warmer air uh, south of the jet. And that can, that can drive stormy, windy weather. So our relation to the storm track definitely um, provides windier weather along, along the coasts. Um, I'd expect it to be generally stormier and windier in the Pacific Northwest, for sure. Um, I can't say, I'd imagine it would be calmer away from the, from the jet stream and the major storm track, but it really would be tied pretty closely to how close to the, to the storms you are. That's a good question. Um, Seth has another one. 
Ethan, does La Nina have a bearing on the density of the snow? Lighter and fluffier versus heavier and wetter snow? Um, I think the, that's a great question, but I think the, the time scale difference that we're thinking about there is a little um, separate. So, you know, overall, you can say certain things about how much precip is going to fall on average and the temperatures, but you can't really draw a direct connection to snow densities. Uh, that really has to do with a storm by storm basis. And as we saw, you know, it's a La Nina winter and we just had rain up to, you know, 92, 9,300 feet where I was today. And uh, so it's, it's really a more of a, a storm by storm basis when you're talking about um, snow densities. And really the direction that the, that the moisture is coming from. If, if you hear the words atmospheric river and you see that it's going to be strong wind from the south and southwest, I mean, you could, you could probably hang your hat on the fact that that's going to be a little bit of a warmer storm uh, than when a front goes through, a cold front moves through, and then we get northwest wind and uh, light, dry, fluffy snow that tends to kind of be the end of a storm that we, off, we often see up in the west and northwest corners of our forecast area. All right, we've got a live one. Annie has raised her hand to ask a question. So Annie, you can go ahead and ask it. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. And just so you know, I doubled down and put my question in the Q and A so you can um, clear that. Ethan, that was super fun. Especially, I am happy with how that dice roll at the end went. Um, I was driving down from the past day and we were looking at Durance and we were just sort of like talking about what it, what the season will need to feel safe again. And um, we were looking at Durance and we were like, well, maybe Durance will just melt out and then we'll kind of have like a fresh start there. Um, and it's largely brown looking, but there is snow between the sagebrush. So my question is like, in order to feel good about like, okay, this thing melted and now we're sort of building from scratch, do you need it to be fully gone or is it, I don't know, is that question kind of clear enough or? Yeah. I know it's very specific, but I mean it more broadly. That was just sort of like the starting point for me thinking about that today. Definitely. So in general, if you have kind of a, yeah, that's a bit of a tough one. So I've had collapses in when I could see sagebrush poking out, you know, from the snowpack I was walking around on. So weak layers can exist even with sagebrush in and around it. Um, you also, I mean, to, to pose more danger though, you need those weak layers to be more connected and less disrupted. So the less snow you get or the, the shallower that snow is, the more stuff is sticking up into it, logs, sticks, sagebrush, that sort of thing. And uh, you might walk into a little open section and get a collapse and then walk through a bunch of sagebrush and not get anything. Um, if you can see kind of where I'm getting at with that. Um, in order to completely reset, I mean, with how weak the snow is that we had early season, personally, I would like to see it completely gone or so soaked that the facets turn into just an ice mash uh, that refreezes. Um, I mean, those are really, if you had to point to it and say, well, that's a lot better than it was, it would take a lot of water and then refreezing, like throughout the snowpack, that weak layer, wherever it is or I'd like to see it go back to brown and then uh, keep tabs on it as the snowfall accumulates. But of course, just because it started as brown and snowed a foot, doesn't mean that foot couldn't end up fastening over the next four or five days. And then the next storm, you're looking at a new wheat layer. So um, if you can hit it right after it goes from brown to white, like during or that day, I'd feel pretty good about it. Awesome. And if it did do, you know, that scenario you talked about where we got a lot of moisture in the snowpack and just soaked it, would then the next thing that we would need to be a storm to come in really warm and then go 
turn to really cold just so that it would try to bind to that ice or because it seems like that would then just be a whole new slippery layer that things could slide off of right it certainly could yeah it really kind of depends on the specifics of um of how it got wet how wet it got how it refroze and how the new storm comes in but generally speaking if a storm comes in warmer and wetter uh, it can bond to those older weak layers better than if it came in light, fluffy, and dry. Awesome, thanks for tackling that. You bet. Thanks, Annie. All right, does anyone else have questions? You can ask just like Annie did by hitting the raise hand button or typing in the Q&A. And as those questions brew, and we'll wait for a couple to come in here, um, just a few more. I just wanna remind everyone to mark your calendars for the next Digging Deeper on January 6th. And that is about professional avalanche rescue, the who, what, when, where, and why. And we'll hear from a few local experts about those topics. Um, so be sure to mark your calendars. It'll be the same Zoom link as this one. And Ethan, do you have any more thoughts for us? Oh, well, hold, hold that one. <laughs> We've got another question. <laughs> okay, so we'll dive back into the questions here. So Idaho Power and various irrigation districts are actively iodine seeding for winter storms. What is the effect on the Wood River Valley? That's a tricky question. Yeah, I'd have to, um... I'd have to send you to their website to find to find the details. I can't recall the specifics, but uh, obviously it's not cheap and water is worth a lot of money. And um, so they're, they're cloud seeding in the different river basins um, in order to enhance the overall snowpack, even just by a little bit over an entire basin equals a lot of water coming down into dams for power. So. Um, it really isn't going to make a one inch storm into a 10 inch storm. That's just, that's just not going to happen. Um, but it is over the course of the winter going to provide a small bump in our overall snow and water totals basin wide. Okay. They're pretty cool. Pretty cool technology. All right, any other questions? We'll give a few more minutes for those to, to come through. All right, we have Ethan captive right here. It's a great time to, to quiz him out um, about anything weather and snow or coffee roasting. There you go. I mean, I'm curious about the coffee roasting. I'm not quick to give away those secrets though. <laughs> we'll have to prod a little bit harder for that one. Yeah. So, well, I just wanna say again, thank you to everybody who is watching on behalf of the Friends of the Sawtooth Avalanche Center. And also a huge thank you to Ethan for sharing so much wisdom and knowledge. Greatly appreciate the time it takes to put these presentations together. And the other forecasters who are behind the scenes right now helping with the technology of putting this all together, their expertise is with snow and I've learned that they also have a new expertise with Zoom. Um, so huge thank you to those guys as well. Um, right, another thing to think of for those of you who are still on here is we're encouraging all backcountry users, if you're a skier, split boarder, snowshoer, um, snowmobiler, any type of person that's getting out in the backcountry, or if you're even just going on a cruise in your car up over Galena Pass, to submit the observations that you see happening in the mountains, um, take pictures, touch, you know, dig in the snow. It doesn't have to be a very detailed snow pit profile. It can be really simple of what you saw in the snow out in the mountains and post that on social media and you can tag hashtag Sawtooth Avi or just tag us and we'll be sure to get that forwarded to the forecasters so that they can use that in their 
database of information that helps form the whole picture. And also you can go to the website, sawtoothavalanche.com, where you can submit more formal observations and include any depth of information that you feel comfortable. And that can be totally anonymous as well. Or you can text a number that's on the website or email info at Sawtooth Avalanche, or even send them direct email. So Ethan at Sawtooth Avalanche, and all of that information is highly valuable for putting together the full picture of what's happening out there. Um, Ethan, do you have any insight on observations or encouragement to people to share what they're seeing out there? Yeah, it's actually been pretty incredible the amount of public observations that we've seen so far this year. And uh, really, I just wanna thank everybody for taking the time to submit them because we read every one and each little piece of information that we get goes into creating a more complete and accurate forecast. And it really does matter. And it becomes a nice uh, database for you guys to check in um, to see what other people are seeing out there in the field. So thank you very much. Yeah. And I just added one more thing into the chat box here. It is a direct link to the PayPal for the friends of the Sawtooth Avalanche Center. It feels, it can feel tricky when we're asking over Zoom, um, but this is one of the, the friends contribute over 50% of the annual budget for the Sawtooth Avalanche Center um, to, with their operating budget. And so that comes from our community events and not having those in person, we've been reaching out and encouraging people. If you are able to donate any amount, it really goes to a great cause and, and benefits a lot of people and all of our backcountry users. So we greatly appreciate that. And there is a link in the chat box here if you are in the giving mood. Um, and with that, I think we have all of our questions answered. Um, thanks again for everyone for joining us and tuning in and let's have our fingers crossed that Ethan's prediction was correct, that it will be cold with an above average snowpack. And I hope everybody has happy holidays. Keep your eyes peeled on social media at Sawtooth Avi and on the website sawtoothavalanche.com for upcoming education events. We have some intro to avalanche courses that you may want to share with some of your friends who are just getting into backcountry travel um, or watch yourself for a great refresher. And also the Beacon Park at the Baker Creek lot will soon be up and running. So you can go and practice your transceiver and companion rescue skills. And any final words from Ethan before we chime out here? I just wish everybody a, a happy and a safe holiday wherever you might be. And we'll see you in the new year. All right. Happy holidays, everyone. Take care.